Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of 805 Inspires. Today we're going to take a look at the Santa Barbara Botanic Gardens. We're going to talk history, seeds, native plants, and preservation. I hope you join, enjoy this episode of 805 Inspires. I'm Eric Davis with TV Santa Barbara. So we're here learning about the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, and I'd like to welcome in the Garden's Director of Education and Engagement, Scott Pipkin. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, Eric. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated by the history of some of these museums and gardens. Can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the history of the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden? The Santa Barbara Botanic Garden is one of the oldest botanic gardens dedicated primarily to native plants in the nation. So the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden's mission is uh, to protect and restore California's native hab plants and habitats for the health and well-being of people and the planet. And the history of this comes from some of our founding members of the garden, in particular, Dr. Frederick Clements, who was one of the early ecologists in the United States. And he was really interested in creating a garden that went from the mountains to the sea and highlighted the various vegetation communities of the West. Uh, as you can imagine, Eric, it's not super easy to get that kind of real estate in Santa Barbara, even in the 1920s. Uh, so this parcel right here above the Mission and Mission Canyon became the primary garden space. And very quickly, uh, the garden founders realized that an emphasis on just California's native plants was a worthy pursuit. So since that time, we have had a beautiful garden that is currently 78 contiguous acres that highlights a variety of California's habitat and plant communities. So you can go from uh, the desert vegetation of California to the redwoods of California uh, in about a tenth of a mile, which is a pretty incredible opportunity. And there's a lot, a lot there in terms of history too. I, I was just ta talking about the aqueduct and some of the historical elements um, at the garden. Yeah, the garden is uh, extensive. As I said, there's 78 acres. We have over five miles of hiking trails and our sections are arranged in, in a few ways. Some of the sections of the garden are really highlighting habitat communities. So for instance, the redwoods, uh, it feels like you're in a redwood grove. Even though our redwood trees were planted in the 1930s, they're only about 90 years old, they're still kind of teenagers as far as redwoods go. Uh, but you can also, if you go to the east side of the garden by the Pritzloff Conservation Center, see a variety of plants from the islands of California, ranging from off the coast of Baja, California, all the way up to the Channel Islands uh, offshore here in Santa Barbara County. Also in the Pritzloff Conservation Center is where the garden houses its herbarium. Um, so many of the, the garden lands that you see, uh, we consider our living collections, these living plants. But we also have a non-living collection uh, of our living museum. Uh, the non-living portion shows a variety of plants uh, and where they've occurred throughout California. I love the redwood section and that the size of these trees are just amazing. But you know, for me, one of the iconic things is, is that uh, poppy grove up, up the hill and the beautiful vistas. Tell us a little bit about that. Right, so the, the meadow has been one of the mainstays of the garden. Uh, forever, essentially. Many people uh, harken back to the iconic images of the great vast field of poppies. And really, that section is emblematic of California's annual wildflower shows, which, as most of us uh, avid wildflower enthusiasts know, can be uh, boom and bust. So there's a wide variety of looks that the meadow can have, and it really reflects uh, California's climate as, as a very arid climate, a Mediterranean climate. Precipitation uh, is unpredictable. And so the meadow, we like to say, has as many moods as there are uh, in coastal California. Uh, so in April and May, you can expect to see wide swaths of wildflowers. And perhaps in the summer or into the fall, you see some of the grasses start to senesce and they get kind of this glowing brownish red color um, so it's ever-changing, and it's really a fantastic feature of the garden, particularly because of the view that you get up to the San Ynez Mountains. I know research is a big component of what you do. Can you talk about how you tie in your work with research? 
Absolutely. Uh, since our mission is to understand and protect native plants and habitats, it's important that we understand and protect those plants outside of our garden space. So the conservation and research program is really focused on three primary aspects of understanding, protecting, and restoring the incredible biodiversity that we have in California. And as we know, most of that biodiversity starts with plants. Plants are the only things, essentially, that can convert the sun's energy into usable energy for other organisms. So if we can understand what's going on with the plants of California, we can better understand what's going on with California as a whole. And do you have any personal favorites in the garden? For me, it's almost like a grand tour of California, and that's what I really appreciate. And Scott, we started this series um, highlighting museums and gardens during the middle of the pandemic. How did you handle that, and, and what was, what was this, how has this been like for you? You know, it, it, this has been a, a major impact for everybody, obviously. And for us, uh, one of the big things has been ensuring that people have access to the garden because we know that spending time outdoors is a, a great alternative right now. It's uh, in terms of public health. This is enjoying fresh air is one of the best things that we can do. So we've really been focusing on making sure that uh, currently our garden is open for our membership. Uh, from the days of Friday through Tuesday uh, by reservation. We're hoping to increase that access, but we've also been really thinking about all of these digital tools that we have available uh, to us. So the fact that we're, t we're talking right now, uh, I'm sitting in the garden and you're at the TVSB studios and we're able to communicate about the garden's mission and leverage these virtual tools that we have. So we've really been working on presenting webinars uh, some of our lectures, translating those to webinar formats, some of our classes, presenting those online, uh, creating new opportunities for people to enjoy the outdoors uh, by staging uh, nature journaling clubs that we've been meeting virtually, which has been really amazing, watching people in a variety of locations, all observing California plants, all sharing their observations with each other. It's a different way of doing it, but it's been really fun and really exciting to explore. How could people learn more about what you're doing, both virtually and with hours and things like that? Yeah, so of course, uh, we, we keep our website updated. So information uh, about joining as a member. We also have a calendar of our events as they get presented. I encourage you to check out our Facebook and our Instagram. We also have a, a YouTube channel, Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. And we've been sharing lots of interesting videos. Uh, we've been able to explore a little bit of 360 degree camera technology. So you can watch videos in different sections of the garden. And whether you have three dimensional uh, augmented reality technology or not, you can use your cursor to kind of look around. So you don't have to listen to me when I'm talking about the redwoods. You can just look at the redwoods on the video. If you have something like Google Card cardboard or one of the other augmented reality glasses, you can actually use those videos and look around in the scene as if you were standing there yourself. And we have all of those up on our YouTube channel right now. Well, thank you, Scott. This is fascinating. Great transition. And, and, and we appreciate all the great work you do at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. As we uh, close with your segment, is there anything that you would like to tell uh, people watching the show out there? Well, as I'm sitting here in the garden, the weather is gorgeous. The breeze is flowing through the leaves, and I just hope folks have the opportunity to get outside and enjoy this beautiful region that we live in and climate that we have. Thank you, Scott. That's Scott Pipkin, Director of Education and Engagement for the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Thanks again, and, and be well. Thank you very much, Eric. Really appreciate it. Okay, I'm now joined by Dr. Denise Knapp, the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden's Director of Conservation and Research. Uh, Denise, welcome to 805 Inspires. Hey, thanks so much for having me. First thing is just we need to give plants props uh, for being the, the primary producers. They're the primary organisms that make us all food and support the rest of the food web. Uh, beyond that, um, it's really important that we have as many kinds of plants as possible. Um, every plant has a job to do, at least one, and, uh, and so we need all of them to together provide the services that we need um, like stabilizing our slopes and providing uh, plants for pollinators, supporting our food web, um, 
providing clean air and clean water. There are so many basic things that humans need that we rely on plants for. Um, and California is super diverse. We have 6,500 different kinds of plants in the state. Uh, it's a quarter of the species in North America, north of Mexico. And, uh, and we, we need all those things to, to do all of those jobs. Um, and it's more than just uh, flowers, it's trees. And talk about the, the different types of species that you, you work with there. Uh, it, well, like I said, everything has a job to do and it takes all kinds. You've got the trees, uh, things like oaks and sycamores that are providing shade and slope stability. And then you have all the things growing underneath them from ferns to flowers to shrubs. Uh, you've got vines crawling all over in between uh, and everything's just sort of filling those spaces and doing their jobs. So your title is Director of Conservation and Research. What does a day look like for you? Uh, it really depends. Um, I, I try to do research of my own. Uh, I am ecologist and I study plant-insect interactions and the effects of plant invaders. Uh, and um, habitat restoration. So I try to get that in, but uh, I'm also managing the department and um, being a member of the senior staff. So just kind of helping the place run and really just trying to, uh, trying to help and advise to forward the cause of conserving California's native plants. This building, we've only been in here for, I don't know, five years. Uh, and it's the first time we've had real labs. Um, so we've got a multi-purpose lab where we can um, clean rare plant seeds or sort bugs or uh, analyze soil or mount herbarium specimens. We've got uh, a genetics lab where we can do all kinds of um, studies to understand our biodiversity, um, to understand what it's going to take to protect rare plants. Um, we've got double the herbarium space where we have all of our dried and pressed plant specimens that we really need to, to do that work. Will you tell us a little bit about not just the facility location but where are the other places you do your work? We do work all over the place. Um, our, our general domain is the Central Coast and the Channel Islands, um, but lately we've been doing work even farther afield. So we've got field sites um, all over the state right now, actually, where we're collecting um, seeds of rare plants to make sure that nothing goes extinct. Um, we do a lot of work on the California Channel Islands. We've done that for a very long time. Uh, we do work on the Carrizo Plain and uh, Monterey County and um, obviously Santa Barbara County, Ventura County. And how could people that are watching this show help to understand and protect and restore um, some of the native plants and habitats that they come across? Uh, good question. Um, so many different ways people can get involved. Um, you can get involved as a volunteer. You can help us to do that work, cleaning rare plant seeds, mounting herbarium specimens, processing bugs to help us do that work. Um, you can help get out uh, act actively restoring uh, habitat. Um, you can just donate to the cause. Um, we have some community science projects where you can be the scientist and help us gather data. For instance, in the Thomas fire, um, we have, uh, let's see, I guess 60 different people out who are hiking trails and looking for rare plants and weeds for us. And you mentioned that there's 6,500 species of native plants. Uh, why, are, why do native plants matter in nature? So there's 65 different kinds of plants in California and uh, most of those are native, not all of them. Um, but, but they matter because, uh, well, uh, so many different reasons. Um, but one of them is um, just that California has plants that nothing, no other state has. So they're called endemic and about a third of our, our plants are found only here in California. So they're unique, they're part of our heritage and uh, you know, I think that we should protect them and make sure that we don't lose any of them. We start to lose species and it's a slippery slope, we lose more. And then like I said, all those jobs that those plants do uh, can't be done as well. So Denise, this is fascinating. How could people plant natives at home? Planting natives at home is a really great way to help the environment. So uh, you can create habitat in your own backyard and that can be fun uh, to observe all the life that colonizes your yard. Um, try to tell who the different things are um, and, uh, and really help combat all the things that are threatening our biodiversity from invasive plants. Uh, if you're planting a native, you know you're not planting an invasive. 
um, to uh, habitat destruction and habitat fragmentation. So if we can kind of soften our impact in cities, uh, then we can really be part of the solution. Fascinating. Thanks for all you do for uh, the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, for California, um, and we appreciated having you on today. Okay, we're back with Scott, who's going to introduce an activity. This is one of the segments that we've been doing with the 805 Inspire. So, uh, Scott, will you tell us a little bit about what you've got planned today? Absolutely. So, uh, we know that biodiversity is important. And one of the keys for protecting bio biodiversity is understanding it. So today what we're going to do is a little activity uh, where we're encouraging folks to do a little bit of nature journaling. Uh, maybe meet a tree, get to know a plant a little bit better, spend some time observing it and paying attention to how else that plant interacts with other organisms in your backyard, in your neighborhood, or wherever you like to hang out outside. This is a great way to get a deeper connection with natural resources and the plants around us. People at home, please enjoy this activity. Hi everybody, it's Scott, the Garden's Director of Education and Engagement. And for today's activity, I'd like to talk about how we can be better neighbors in nature. So oftentimes when we think about our neighborhood, we think about the people in our neighborhood, the services in our neighborhood, the places to go, the things to do. But I'd like to remind you that your neighborhood also involves the plants and the animals all around you, and especially the plants, because Thank you, plants. The plants give us the air we breathe. So we should really get to know them a little bit better because they're pretty important neighbors. So I have a few activities you can do to get to know your neighbors in nature just a little bit better. So the first thing that you want to do is get your materials together. And this activity is really nice because it doesn't require too many materials. The first thing that you'll need to do is to find a green plant and you can find a green plant just about anywhere in your community. You may have a plant in a pot. You might have a great big tree in your yard or on the street. You can even go and find a grassy field or lawn and look for plants. I bet you if you look closely, you'll find more than just grass growing in that lawn. Once you've identified your plant, what you'll want to do is get out a writing utensil and something to write with. I'm going to use this journal, uh, but you can use a piece of loose leaf paper on cardboard. It really doesn't matter. Uh, now, once you've gotten your materials together, you should look really closely at your plant. Take a moment, scan around, and ask or say to yourself, write down three prompts. And those are, I notice, I wonder, and it reminds me of. So if I look carefully at this plant, I notice there's some insects here. I notice that some flowers are persisting, whereas some seem to have gone away. I wonder when did this flower start blooming? And I can also say it reminds me of, if I look carefully at the veins on this leaf, the way they sit, it kind of reminds me of a basketball a little bit, how the grooves on a basketball look. So look really carefully at your plant and go through those three prompts. I notice, I wonder, and it reminds me of. After you've gone through and done that, you should take a few minutes and now to get to know your neighbor even better, try to draw a sketch of it. And I know that can sound like a scary thing. A lot of us don't consider ourselves great artists and that's okay because when we're sketching our plant, we're not necessarily trying to draw a photorealistic rendition we're trying to get to know it better. So I'll show you an example of something I've been working on. So on this page, I've gone through and I've discussed what I notice, what I wonder, what it reminds me of. And here I've started drawing a little bit of a sketch. And I'm not the world's greatest artist by any means, but what I can do is I can start to label my sketch and turn it into a diagram. Because again, the point isn't necessarily to make a beautiful work of art. The point is to get to know your neighbor better. And to do that, we really need to spend some time with it and we need to make some observations. In order to get to know something, you have to get to know it. And drawing is a great way to get to know a plant. So give it a try. So remember, no matter where you live, you're part of a community. And of course, that community includes the people, your neighbors, your family, the people that provide services for you. But your community also includes all of these things all around you, all of the green living plants, and if you take a moment to notice, to wonder, to see what they remind you of, 
you'll realize that we are way more connected to these green things than you may have ever thought before. So give it a chance. Take a moment. Become a better neighbor in nature and tell us what you find. Thanks, and we'll catch you next time on 805 Inspires. Well, I hope you enjoyed that fascinating behind the scenes look at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden and the importance of native plants. Um, I'm Eric Davis, Executive Director of TV Santa Barbara, and that's another episode of 805 Inspires.